It is so important that we as Christians, we as Catholics, are students of history. Very important. If we knew our history, we would know that wokeness is as old as the Bible itself, as portrayed in today's first reading, a reading from the book of Genesis. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah had become so depraved that they looked upon depravity as good and traditional virtuous behavior as bad. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it, in today's society? Abraham couldn't even find 10 virtuous people to save the city of Sodom. And yet God was willing to save it if those people would only turn to him. That must, we must never forget that St. Therese of Lisieux said that our, God's justice gave her so, just as much comfort as his mercy because a just judge would never be unjust to anyone. Lot and his family had to literally run for their lives, not only because God was going to strike Sodom and Gomorrah, but also because it was dangerous living in Sodom and Gomorrah. At one point, some of the citizens wanted to abuse the two visitors, the two angels who were visiting Lot and his family, and they were ready to beat down the door to get at them. The situation was not good. You know, we live in a society, a culture, where everything has been turned upside down. The obvious example is abortion. How many people out there today are clamoring about how important abortion is to this country, that we need it, that it's good, that it gives women freedom. And yet on the other hand, they're attacking the existence of crisis pregnancy centers, that they should all be shut down. Why? Because they're giving help to pregnant ladies? They're providing for their education? They're giving them money to help them buy food and medicine? They're giving them daycare, whatever they need? Why should they be burned down? And yet in today's society, we hear prominent politicians in the United States saying that these crisis pregnancy centers must be closed because they mistreat women? Abortion doesn't? This is all crazy. Or what about if I consider gay marriage as not being good? Do I set myself up for a hate crime charge? Or what about if I'm anti-crime? I'm anti-arson. I don't want to see innocent people lose their businesses to arson. Am I proclaimed a racist? Yes, in today's society, I would be. The great servant of God, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, was a student of history. And quite frankly, he was a modern prophet. In fact, he was a great prophet. You know, back in the year 1947, that's 75 years ago, he was warning us about what was coming down the road, what was coming down the pike. And he was clear, and he was accurate, and he was precise. He said during a radio broadcast, and I quote, we are at the end of Christendom. Pretty strong statement. 1947. We are at the end of Christendom. Christendom is economic, political, social life as inspired by Christian principles. That is ending. We've seen it die. Then he says, look at the symptoms. The breakup of the family, divorce, abortion, immorality, general dishonesty. 1947? 
What would he say today? What would he say today? And Bishop Sheen said that one of the signs of the times was that basic dogmas in our modern world are disintegrating before our very eyes. And they are being replaced by other things, such as, number one, there is no other function for man in life than to acquire wealth. Wealth is number one. Or number two, man is naturally good, meaning there's no need for God-given rights. There's not even a need to be saved. We don't need a savior because man has it all. Or number three, the main goal of life is not to seek one's soul, but rather devise new technical advances. 1947. Wow. What would he say today with our smartphones and everything else? People today owe their allegiance to social media, not sacred scripture or the catechism of the Catholic Church. For many people, social media is their moral compass. Public opinion is what's most important to people nowadays. Mediocrity and compromise characterize the lives of many Christians today in our world. And then Bishop Sheen says back in 1947, I quote him again here, with the family disintegrating with one divorce after every two marriages in 35 major cities in the United States, with five divorces for every six marriages in Los Angeles, there is no denying that something has snapped Anyone who has anything to do with God is hated today. 1947, I thought those were the golden years. What would he say today? So yes, we are in a crisis, but should our response be despair, despondency, discouragement? Of course not. Perhaps we as Christians, perhaps we as Catholics should look at the present crisis as an opportunity rather than getting in front of the computer and looking at the blogs and complaining about everything that's happening in the world. For example, let's think about the prodigal son because of a famine. What happened? He went to his father, right? There was an opportunity for grace right there. What about the good thief who was crucified with our Lord and found our Lord in his crucifixion? Bishop Sheen says, one of the surprises of heaven will be to see how many saints were made in the midst of chaos and war and revolution. These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Of course, that's a reference to the book of Revelation chapter 7. We've been trying for years, coming up with human plans to turn everything around, politics, elections. I can't tell you how many times. Every four years, this is the most important election that we've ever experienced. If we don't do it now, it's not gonna survive. And then four years later, it's the same thing. Four more years of the same nonsense. Human solutions don't work when it comes to such a crisis. The only way out of this crisis is spiritual. What are the steps of this spiritual recovery? First and foremost, we priests need to be priests. We priests must fight against wokeness. How do we do that? By being watchmen by preaching the truth in season and out of season. As one author says, and I quote, that does not mean that we go out finding fault in other people to enjoy the delight of criticism, but it does mean we must never present evil as something but evil. We must never pretend that arsenic is mere flour or sugar. 
If you consume arsenic, it doesn't matter what your opinion of it is, it kills. If you do the evil, it does not matter what you have worked up as a justification for it, it does spiritual harm nonetheless. It can kill. So during a crisis, we as priests don't make confession and other sacraments less available. We make them more available, right? We don't stop adoration of the Blessed Sacrament because we're afraid of germs. We increase the hours of Eucharistic adoration so that the people will be nourished properly because there's nothing worse than spiritual, spiritual starvation. Nothing worse. That's what led us to this crisis to begin with, right? Number two, it's time not to be ashamed of being identified as a practicing Catholic. For too many years, I've watched people be ashamed, hiding their miraculous medal, going into a restaurant and refusing to make the sign of the cross for the blessing of the food, because people might see that I'm a Catholic. That's awful. That's awful. You can go into some Catholic homes and they look like sports museums with sports paraphernalia all over the walls and everything. But where's the crucifix? Where's the statue of Our Lady? Where's the religious art? Is there any sign at all that this is a house of God? That the people in this house actually put God first before anything in their lives? These are all things that we have to ask ourselves. And then number three, prayer, which is what today's gospel is all about. Without prayer, we will die. How did Abraham confront the wokeness of Sodom and Gomorrah? Prayer. Because that's what the gospel passage, I mean, the first chapter, uh, the, the first reading was all about in the book of Genesis, right? Our, Abraham was praying. He was having a conversation with God. That comes first before anything. The entire history of salvation is God wooing us back to himself. In other words, it's important for us to once again become, to become intimate with God Almighty. He wants intimacy with us. That's what the Blessed Sacrament, that's what the Holy Eucharist is all about. The miracle of the Eucharist is the fact that God Almighty can touch us as Catholics 365 days a year. We can literally, physically touch God Almighty. I remember one of the greatest Sundays of my life was when I gave my nephew and godson, little Dwayne, some of you know little Dwayne, uh, little Duane has Down syndrome, but when he was a little boy, I had the great honor as a deacon to give him his first Holy Communion. And I remember when it came time for his Holy Communion in our little church of St. Henry's in Natural Bridge, New York, he came up and his hands were folded perfectly, he was dressed perfectly, and I saw an awe in his face because he was getting excited he was getting excited about the fact that he was going to be able to touch God. What an intimate moment. That was a teaching moment for everyone else in that little church. And yet here in America, before the COVID crisis, only 30% of American Catholics went to Sunday Mass. Now I believe it's down to around half that, about 15%. It's even worse in Europe. In France, the mass attendance, the eldest daughter of the church, mass attendance in France is 4%. Four out of every 100 Catholics in France go to Sunday Mass. 
I think it's probably that bad in Germany and Italy and all the other countries in Europe because people have lost their friendship with God. Any friendship takes an effort. Any friendship takes effort. So we cannot turn from God without hurting ourselves. As one author says, there is no true intimacy between lovers if they don't communicate. The breakdown of communication in society, whether between spouses, family members, or even within entire communities, is the great dampener of intimacy. He goes on to say a lack of intimacy is not necessarily a lack of words. In fact, maybe we need to stop talking so much. You're probably thinking that right now. You don't need words for intimacy. I remember the example of an elderly couple who were married 60 years and they were on their front porch, each in their own rocking chair next to each other. And guess what? They were together. And they didn't have to tell each other, I love you, because each of them knew that the other spouse loved them. So sometimes you might want to say, well, why would I want to go to the Fathers of Mercy Chapel in the afternoon and spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament? I don't know what to say. Well, how about sitting there and saying nothing and listening to the Lord speak to us? That's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. I can't tell you how many times I've been overwhelmed with my crosses and duties and I think, how can I bear this anymore? And then I go in front of the Blessed Sacrament and I just sit there, maybe complain a little bit. But after an hour, I'm ready to get going again. So at the beginning of this COVID crisis, we started to have adoration seven days a week from noon until 5.30 every day, seven days a week. And I've been inviting people to come and be intimate with their Lord. Come and be with him. You don't even have to say anything. Leave your smartphone in the car and just be with him. Be with him. We have so much noise in the world. We need to go to a quiet place. Because isn't that what Jesus did? You want to be more Christ-like? Go in a quiet place and pray. That's what Jesus himself did. To be alone and intimate with his Father. As St. Teresa of Calcutta used to say, God speaks to us in the silence of our hearts. God bless you.